Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the third annual Black in Immuno Week, a week where we will celebrate, amplify, and support Black voices in immunology. Before we begin, we'd like to thank our major sponsors who've made this week possible. You can find our full list of sponsors on our website. And please don't forget to tweet about our session today using the hashtag Black in Immuno Week. Uh, make sure every word is capitalized for accessibility purposes. We will have live captions and ASL interpreters during each session. Please click on the CC at the bottom of the screen to access captions. And you can submit your questions through the comment function on the platform, um, not the Q&A. Um, and lastly, as a reminder, we require all audience members to be polite and respectful while in the Black and Immuno space. If we see anything offensive, your comment will be deleted immediately and you'll be removed from the platform. After the conclusion of the week, recorded videos will be posted on our YouTube channel and transcripts will be made available on our website, blackandimmuno.org. My name is Kristen Carter. I'm currently a postdoc at Yale and I will be the moderator for the Immunology Without Borders session, a session highlighting powerful science that has done internationally or with international collaborations and has had global impacts. Today, we will have five speakers here to tell us about their work. They have about 15 minutes each for their presentations and we'll follow up with a five minute Q&A. So without further ado, let's jump in. Our first speaker for this session is Dr. Munya Musvosfi. Dr. Musvosfi completed his PhD and postdoctoral fellowship at the South African Tuberculosis Vaccine Initiative based at the University of Cape Town. In his current role, his research efforts are focused on the interface of TB immunology and clinical translation of promising TB vaccine concepts and TB biomarkers. Munya has led several projects that have characterized T cell responses induced by candidate TB vaccines, assessed promising TB biomarkers, and identified antigens for candidate TB vaccines. Through his research, Dr. Musvosfi hopes to gain insights that will ultimately reduce the disease burden caused by tuberculosis. Welcome, Munya. Great, thank you. Um, and I'd like to um, first thank the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to share some of the work that we're, we're doing. Um, and kind of as a, the brief that was uh, provided to us was to kind of give a little bit of background as to the journey uh, that I took into immunology. So I'm gonna spend the first couple minutes just kind of discussing some of my, my background. So originally I'm born, I was born in uh, Zimbabwe uh, and I spent the first eight years uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, in 1995, uh, my parents had an opportunity to move to Michigan to further their studies. And over the next 10 years, my parents, uh, my father would get his doctorate and my mom would get her MBA. And during this time, I obviously was in, in school. Uh, and during school, I, I quite enjoyed science. Um, so I always had a, a, a I guess, inkling towards uh, science. Uh, but when it came time to graduating uh, high school in 20, 2005, my parents were moving back to Zimbabwe to be lecturers. Uh, and I had a decision to make whether to stay in the US to continue uh, my college studies. Uh, and that was gonna be quite tricky as an international student. Uh, international fees were, were quite pricey. Um, but I had an uncle who was a lecturer at the University of Cape Town, and he mentioned that UCT, uh, which is University of Cape Town, was an excellent uh, university. And essentially, I went there for my undergraduate uh, degree. And in the last year of my um, undergraduate degree, I took a course called Infectious Diseases and Immunology. And essentially, from there, I was, I was hooked, went on to do my MSc and my PhD and my, my postdoc, uh, really all in, in South Africa. Um, and today I'm going to be speaking a little bit about work that we've been doing, uh, work that um, just got accepted and we hope to be published uh, beginning of, of next year. So in terms of uh, what makes our uh, environment unique, that was another uh, topic that I think the organizers asked me to just touch a little bit about on, was we have a very unique uh, environment where we're able to study human infectious diseases using human samples. Um, and really, this is quite a powerful um, approach that we've taken because it really allows us to be able to be as close to the disease burden um, as we can and also have the facilities to be able to do uh, excellent and exciting science. This is just to highlight a little bit of what uh, the South African TB Vaccine Initiative, or SATV, does. 
our main goal is to get a new TB vaccine. Uh, and we do this through running clinical trials. And what I've just highlighted here are a number of different trials ranging from phase one to phase four of different vaccine candidates uh, over the past 21 years. So you can see that we do quite a, a lot of work uh, across different vaccines uh, uh, throughout the, the year, throughout the 21 years. So today I'm gonna to be speaking mainly uh, about a project that, uh, as I mentioned, recently just got uh, completed. Uh, and it was a project that tried to look at uh, correlates of risk between individuals who controlled TB infection and those who progressed TB disease. So there's a reasonable amount of information that's known about the importance or the role of T cells in uh, controlling mycobacterium tuberculosis or the agent that causes tuberculosis. Uh, it's known that if you deplete T cells in the animal model, uh, it results in increased uh, bacterial burdens. And if you knock certain components within T cells, so interferon gamma uh, or TNF in T cells, it also results in increased bacterial burden. So highlighting the importance uh, of these particular cell types. The impact of B cells um, is less definitive, uh, although it's likely that B cells and antibodies will play a role uh, in controlling infection. It is quite, um, it's been quite challenging getting the role that these cells uh, play. There is a modest increase uh, when you do knock out B cells in the animal model. So as a result of this, um, most TB vaccines aim to induce a robust T cell response. However, one of the challenges is, you know, what antigens do you put in a uh, TB vaccine? So TB has over 4,000 4, possible vaccine targets. And really the challenge here is which of these antigens uh, does one include? So we took a step back and tried to use uh, our ability to enroll uh, human cohorts to try to address this question. And just for those people who are not familiar with uh, tuberculosis and some of the terminology with TB, uh, there's this uh, uh, concept of latent infection. So where an individual has been exposed, has been infected with TB, but is otherwise healthy. And for the vast majority of individuals who encounter mycobacterium tuberculosis, this is what happens. They do not progress to active TB disease. However, there is a small subset where upon infection, they do go on to progress to active TB disease. And really within the first two years is the highest risk um, of TB uh, progression. So we performed a large study, uh, started in about 2005, where we enrolled over 6,000 um, adolescents. And uh, these adolescents were followed up at various intervals um, and samples were collected. Now, unfortunately, some of these adolescents during the uh, follow-up period uh, went on to develop TB disease. Uh, but what it allowed us to do was we were able to go back to the samples that they had and ask a very simple question. What is different between adolescents who progress to active TB disease compared to those adolescents who are infected at enrollment but do not progress to active TB disease? And we had a host of PBMC vials that we were able to use to address this question. So what I'm showing you here on the uh, left side are adolescents uh, who were uh, latently infected. We followed them up for two years and they did not develop TB disease. And these time points here indicates the time points at which we had samples available. On the right are adolescents uh, who unfortunately progressed to TB disease, but because we've been uh, continually following them up before, uh, during enrollment and follow-up, we had samples before TB diagnosis. So this dashed line here is samples, um, is, represents the day of TB diagnosis. And you can see here, we have quite a bit of samples before TB diagnosis. And we wanted to focus on the T cells because we wanted to see if T cells could tell us which antigens work best. And for those of you who don't uh, live and breathe uh, T cells, uh, essentially what we're looking at here was we're looking at, at the bottom here is you have a CD4 T cell. You have an antigen presenting uh, cell here that is presenting some kind of antigen. You can imagine this is a TB antigen. And what we wanted to know was what types of T cells do progressors and controllers have? And would you use the T cell receptor to be able to give us an identity of that T cell clone? And the question that we asked was, is control of MTB infection associated with certain mycobacterial specific T cell chronotypes? So essentially what we wanted to get to at the end of the study was a list of good TCRs or those TCRs that are associated with controllers and potentially a list of bad TCRs 
or T cell receptors that are associated with progression. Now to identify our TB specific T cells, uh, we took our PBMCs, we thawed them, and we stimulated them with MTB lysate. And this is just a lysate of mycobacterium tuberculosis. We use this as a broad stimulate, stimulant because we do not know which antigens we would find uh, to be associated with control or progressors. Um, and so this was a broad stimulation. And for those of you who like flow cytometry plots, this is just essentially our gating strategy where we uh, gated on CD4s and CD8s. We used CD69, an activation marker, uh, CD154 as well as CD137 to identify cells that uh, were activated during this 12 hour stimulation. And we performed a single cell TCR um, sequencing, which you can see here, where we had both the alpha as well as the beta uh, chain. Uh, so we then uh, had about 25,000 uh, TCR receptors uh, that we termed MTB-specific TCR receptors because these were identified on cells that responded to uh, MTB lysate. And then on top of that, what we then did was we also performed a bulk TCR sequencing where we took PBMCs, we extracted DNA, and we measured uh, all the MTB-specific TCRs, which we had identified in our single cell sorts in this bulk um, TCR sequencing, and therefore we're able to get a frequency of each individual TCR um, in the PBMC sample. Now, of course, one of the main challenges with TCR work is overcoming uh, the limited uh, overlap between TCR repertoires between individuals. Now, in this study, we did not just want to compare individuals, but wanted to compare groups, and therefore it was quite challenging and as you can see here, very few of our TCR sequences were actually found in two or more individuals. So the vast majority of our sequences, so over 96% of our sequences, were only identified in a single donor, therefore making it quite challenging to study this at a per TCR sequence level. So to overcome this, we utilized a uh, technique that clustered TCRs into specificity groups, and these uh, TCRs would share particular motifs that would be thought to uh, be important in binding. So for example, here you have a series of TCR sequences all from different donors, but they share this particular motif and therefore grouped into this particular, uh, into this cluster. Um, and then you're now then there to able to compare uh, the motifs between controllers and progressors. Um, but before we wanted to do that, we actually wanted to make sure that there was some kind of HLA association between a particular motif and a particular HLA allele. So what I'm showing you here uh, is a particular um, motif uh, and its association with DRB115 alleles. So what you have here in black are the number of donors who have this particular allele and have this particular TCR cluster. In gray are those individuals who have the allele but do not have a response. And here you have, again, in black, individuals who have the TCR cluster uh, but do not have the allele present. Uh, and in gray are those individuals with um, the TCR cluster, so with the TCR cluster that's absent as well as they do not have the uh, HLA allele. Therefore, here, this is a uh, association of this particular cluster with this particular allele. And then we went on and asked, uh, do controllers, so controllers here are in blue, and our progressors are in red. Do controllers who have this particular HLA allele have higher frequencies of a particular TCR cluster? So we did this across 176 uh, clusters, and we identified 30 clusters that were statistically significant uh, between controllers and progressors. 20 of these clusters, which is what I'm showing you here, were associated with controllers and 10 clusters were associated with progressors. I'm not showing the uh, progressor clusters here. So you can see here a cluster here that is a DRB15 uh, associated uh, and has this particular motif, which is found to be higher in controllers compared to progressors. So this was a very uh, interesting finding that we we're at least able to identify some clusters that were different between controllers and progressors. However, the real uh, benefit of this study was actually trying to get to antigens. So we needed to actually have a way to be able to move from the TCR cluster 
to an antigen. And for this, we used um, antigen uh, discovery. Turn your camera, turn your camera uh, and here, what we did was we cloned a TCR that was representative of a particular cluster, uh, and we mixed it with its HLA-associated um, uh, APC. And using uh, this four 96-well plates in which uh, each well contained a pool of um, MTB proteins, we're able to identify uh, pools or wells that lit up. So this was a luciferase um, assay. So here, this was a, the, cluster, the, the well in which the epitope was present. And using some deconvolution, we're able to then identify the epitope within that. And we're able to uh, identify epitopes for a number of these clusters. So as I've mentioned here, this is this SVAL cluster that we identified to be, in, to be associated with controllers. We observed it to be associated, to be targeting an epitope within the PE13 family. We also identified another cluster that identified the CFP10, uh, CFP10 epitope that was associated with, with controllers. Uh, and then we also had a cluster uh, that was targeting ESPA that was associated with progressors. So just to kind of finish up here, uh, take home message, we're able to identify dozens of MTB specific TCR specificity groups that were associated with controllers and progressors. Uh, and here we're able to successfully identify some of the epitopes, uh, which was quite important. Uh, that were targeted by these specificity groups uh, enriched in controllers. Um, antigen discovery is still ongoing. So as I've mentioned, we had about 20 clusters that we identified. And here I've just shown three clusters that we identified the epitopes for. So that is um, ongoing. Uh, but more kind of more excitingly, uh, we have some uh, plans to do some preclinical work with uh, some partners uh, here in South Africa. So we have a, a collaborator uh, in Johannesburg, uh, who was able to produce uh, mRNA uh, vaccines. We also have a collaborator at the University of Cape Town who is able to do some of the preclinical work. So by partnering with these two groups, uh, we hope to be able to test uh, whether these uh, vaccine candidates can actually induce protection, at least in the small, um, mod small animal model. Now, of course, uh, a lot of people uh, participated in this study, and I was just kind of fortunate to be able to present some of our findings. Uh, really, we had a team across uh, South Africa, uh, as well as collaborators uh, at Stanford. Uh, I'd obviously like to thank the, the funders, uh, as well as BEI resources for providing some of these reagents. Um, and with that, um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Musfas, for such a great talk on uh, the clinical application of TB immunology. Um, we can now take questions from the audience. I can start, actually, I do have one. Um, just curious, what, so the method of antigen discovery that you use, was that like in ELISA or is there, are there other methods that you can use to uh, discover ant antigens? Yeah, so, so it, was, it, was, um, it was actually using, uh, sorry, I guess I didn't get a lot of time to, to really speak about yeah. it, but we had a, essentially inserted the TCRs of, of interest into Jerkit uh, cell line. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we matched that Jerkit cell line with an antigen presenting cell that expressed the HLA um, that's associated with that particular cluster, uh, we essentially then had um, expression of, of uh, luciferase. Uh, so essentially using the, the luciferase assay uh, to identify uh, jerkets that had been uh, triggered through the TCR binding. Uh, there are other ways to potentially identify antigens, and that's uh, another approach that we're, we're using, uh, such as uh, kind of displaying this on, on yeast. So you essentially have your a TCR uh, that you tetramerize uh, and then using kind of uh, yeast display able to identify uh, binding between this TCR tetramer. Uh, and that's a slightly different approach that one could use to, to identify um, antigen. But really the kind of important bit here was we're able to at least identify some of the TCRs that individuals can then start uh, focusing their attention on in terms of identifying the antigen that these TCRs recognize. 
Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions from Dr. Donald Palmer. Um, what conclusions would you make? Um, is that this associated with HLA or other aspects of antigen processing? Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. So one of the things that we did was we we always matched the controllers and progressors for HLA. So once we had identified a TCR cluster that was associated with uh, a particular uh, HLA allele, would only look at controllers and progressors who had that particular um, HLA allele. Uh, we've looked at the different HLA alleles, and we do not see an association between controllers uh, or progressors with particular HLA alleles. I don't know if that um, answers the question. I, I think there, there might have been a, I guess, in terms of con conclusions that I would, I would draw from this, you know, potentially the importance of particular T cells uh, or, or T cell specificity uh, in terms of controlling infection. Uh, that could be one one uh, conclusion from this. Um, I think one of the interesting findings that we had was some of the clusters that were associated with progressors. Uh, so potentially uh, progression, there's either an enrichment or uh, an abundance of certain T uh, of certain T cell antigens uh, that may be driving some of this um, TCRs that are associated with pro uh, progressors. Great, thank you. Um, our next question comes from Medina Wayne. Um, really interesting work, Dr. Musbosvi. Thank you for sharing. Have you been able to assess the functionality of any of the identified T cells, i.e., with killing assays? Yeah, that, that's a that's a good question, and and that's kind of the, the next phase of what we're doing. So what we are doing on top of this kind of preclinical work is trying to get a better understanding of what these T cells that are associated with controllers actually do. Uh, and and one of the ways that we're planning on doing this would be to enroll. Uh, individuals that are on different spectrums of the TB infection. So individuals that are uh, uninfected, individuals who are healthy but have latent infection, and individuals who have active TB disease, and ask the question, what differences do asso controller-associated T cells have compared to progressor-associated T cells? Uh, I don't think we're going to get to actually look at the, the killing assay. Uh, I don't think we have enough funding for that, but that is a very good uh, suggestion, and hopefully uh, in future, we'll be able to retrieve some PBMCs to do do some of that work. Thank you. And one more question for you. Um, thank you, Dr. Muswalski, for sharing your research. For TB controllers, was this associated with previous vaccinations for MTB? Yeah, so, so in South Africa, everyone um, at birth uh, is given BCG. So both the controllers and progressors uh, would have received BCG um, at birth. Um, and a BCG is currently the only licensed uh, TB vaccine. Uh, an exclusion criteria into these studies would be, you know, enrollment in a study in which a uh, novel TB vaccine uh, was used. But in, in general, you know, these were adolescents that would have only received BCG. Wonderful. Thank you again, Dr. Musbosvi, for your talk. Um, our next speaker for the session is going to be John Tabo. Um, John Oluwafani Tebo is a PhD student in the biochemistry program at Ribeiro Preto Medical School, the University of San Paulo. He has publications in reputable journals that are well cited. As an early career researcher, his interests include biochemistry and molecular biology. He's a review and editorial board member of some reputable journals, and he's interested in cancer immunology and proteomics. Welcome, John. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Um, Good afternoon, or good day, everyone. My name is John Oluwafemi Teibo, a PhD student in the Department of Biochemistry and Immunology and also at the Center for Cell Based Therapy at the University of Sao Paulo, Ibero Preto, in Brazil. Um, actually, today I'll be talking about uncovering the molecular effectors and signaling of possible players in cell immunotherapy. And um, I want to especially appreciate the Black in Immuno um, Organization for this kind invitation. Um, to start with the um, cell-based therapy, I'll start with the chimeric antigen receptor T-cell th T -cell therapy, which actually involves uh, the T-cell or blood generally collected from a patient or healthy donor. And this um, cell can, uh, the T-lymphocyte is actually isolated. And upon isolation of this T-lymphocyte, through the car gene insertion, it can be done either through a viral or non viral vector. Excuse it can me. Be... Do you have yep. slides? We can't see the, your screen. Let's 
question. It's okay. Take your time. Can you see now? Uh, not yet. How about now? Not yet, still. Oh. Stop share. Sorry. Does your screen say that you are sharing them? How about now? No, sorry. Oh, because I I actually choose the windows. Um. Okay. Did you send your slides to Yasin? Because maybe Yasin can share um, his screen and we can have you present that way. No, okay, I haven't. I haven't. How about now? Are you seeing it? No, not yet. Um, oh. Let's see. Oh, no, here we go. Here we go. We can see them now. You can see. Oh, okay. Sorry yes. about that. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> okay. Um, so, as I stated, sorry about the uh, issue. My name is John Tebo from the Department of Biochemistry and Immunology, and I'll be talking on uncovering the molecular effectors and signaling of possible players in cell immunotherapy. And um, one of the major players in cell immunotherapy is actually the chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy in which uh, the generation actually starts when blood sample is collected from either a patient or healthy donor. And this uh, leads to T cell isolation. And from this T cell isolation, the car gene can actually be inserted either through via or non-viral vector. Once we have the chimeric T cell uh, uh, being um, formed, it can be expanded and purified ex vivo, checked for quality control, and then being infused back to the patient as a living drug. And this uh, right. therapy is that Sorry, me again, sorry. Can you share full screen? Because um, we're seeing like the individual slides, like the presentation mode. How about now? Still? I think you might have to reshare the window. Reshare. Okay. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Welcome. Is it okay now? So we can see the slides again. If you click presentation mode, it should give us the presentation view. This we have, I've gone to the presentation mode. Um, still no, not? Still, yeah, we're still seeing individual slides. Mm. Hi, John, I think you have to um, share the entire window, uh, the entire screen instead of just the window. For some reason, it can't go to the whole screen. Like the desktop, you mean, right, Susan? Yeah. Okay. So for, 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 for the sharing profile, if I click entire screen or windows, which one would show better? Entire, entire screen. Entire screen. Entire screen. Yeah. Okay. So this way. Can yeah, you see perfect. Now? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. perfect. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Sorry. Can Thank you. Sorry about the mess. Okay, so we have this um, T cell therapy or the CAT cell therapy that has three domains: the extracellular domain, transmembrane domain, and the endo domain. For the extracellular domain, we have the variable heavy and light chain, and in the transmembrane domain, the 
part that connects the external and the internal and the end domain which is actually the variable region and that progresses as the generation changes so we have to, be able to target us uh, different signaling pathway as the generation progresses uh, this is an overview of the pros and cons of the CAR T cell therapy as well as the CAR NK therapy where generally for the CAR T cell therapy we could get it from autologous or allogenic source why for the KNK therapy, we could also get it from NK cell lines. And there's higher uh, transduction efficiency with the CAR T cell compared to the CAR NK cell with um, better in vivo persistence. But part of the issues is that um, for the CAR T cell therapy, it's associated with cytokine release syndrome as well as neurotoxicity, which is not available for the CAR NK therapy. And um, there are six um, clinically approved um, FDA CAR T cell therapy, why for the KNK therapy, they are currently under uh, clinical trial. Um, basically, this uh, work will be looking at the KNK therapy, but I couldn't start but uh, first with introducing the CAR T cell therapy, which is actually the building block or the starting block of this uh, cell therapy that enhance the uh, enhancement for KNK therapy. For the, uh, what is known for the NK cell um, action in cancer is that it involves recognition between the activity and receptor and the tumor antigen or direct cyto, uh, cytotoxicity when the uh, uh, the granules release uh, um, molecules that actually activate the granulin perforating pathway or through the fast or train lag and it activates the apoptotic cell death or through small molecules that interfere on gamma and um, CS, CCL3 and um, cytokine to activate uh, in modulation. Uh, it has been established uh, in the Center of Cell-Based Therapy here in the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, where there's been efficient and simple platform for the generation of the CAR T-cell therapy, but uh, from a lengthy viral production to the in vivo model and also for the CAR NK therapy. And so on this basis, we decided to uh, fix in the, this particular project where we are looking at the cyclotron, the protein, as well as phosphoprotein, to be able to see if we are able to uncover the mechanism of action of this cell therapy, and as well as will, will we be able to identify a unique signature of protein that can relieve the toxicity associated uh, with this therapy, and as well as identify a unique uh, signature that will serve as prognostic biomarker to be able to actually predict uh, response to treatment, and these are what interests us to be part of this particular um, research. And um, from the lengthy viral production as well to the in vivo, in vitro uh, co-culture cytotoxic is done in collaboration with our uh, uh, partners at the cell-based therapy in Brazil. And then we're working on the proteomics as well as cytotomic study. And this is uh, an overview of the, uh, the flow work in which we use two different um, supernatant from the cell for the cytotome study. and. Um, we use the, the 5% AB plasma and 0% AB plasma to, to see which one work best. And then the whole cell pellet, which was concentrated in for this supernatant, quantified, depleted for albumin, which is a major uh, protein that interferes with uh, uh, proteins of interest. And then we went for to reduce to achilles, digest with trypsin, uh, purified as well as labeled with tandem mass tag and um, analyzed with uh, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, then uh, I did the data analysis with mass content pesos. Um, this is like an overall of the tandem mass tag that was liberal. In which for the cytotomic profile, we have the white type, the NK car, and the car with the interleukin 15 construct. But for the for the proteomic study, we have the NK white type, the car, interleukin 15, as well as interleukin 15 with the receptor alpha construct. And, various labeling profile. So from the preliminary study from uh, what we have for the cytotomics profile, we actually discovered that this uh, took a uh, different condition, whether 0% AB plasma or 5% AB plasma had the same um, expression of protein as because the 0% AB plasma actually had um, human albumin and recombinant uh, insulin and uh, Sorry, John, sorry for interrupting. If you could just raise your voice or come closer to the mic, uh, so that because uh, the interpreters are having a hard time hearing you, would be okay. great. Okay. 
so yeah that's better so okay then we have this um um the the um albumin depletion that was done in which this is our input sample our addition and our flow through we're interested in depleting albumin which is 70 uh, molecular weight protein and we're able to significantly reduce it and we work with the flow through fraction for the subsequent analysis and uh, these are the top uh, regulated proteins that we've found from the secretome profile of our chi nk cells and um, in uh, interesting um proteins that we discovered uh, cd44 which is a, a protein involved in cell cell communication adhesion and cell uh, 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 integration as well as interferon regulatory factor seven and uh, from the gene network, we discovered that bulk of the proteins are involved in regulation of X1 and X2 cascade, as well as the apoptotic pathway, and also as, as regulation of MAP case cascade, as well as cytokine mediated uh, signaling. From the biological pathway, we saw that bulk of the pathways that were operated include the mTOR uh, class 1 PI3K signaling events, as well as interferon uh, gamma and interleukin 5 mediated signaling. Uh, this is uh, the preliminary protein profiling that was done. And from the um, construct, having the car compared to the white type, we saw that the regulated proteins are actually involved in antigen presentation as, pre uh, presentation as well as processing NK cell mediated signaling, uh, type 1 interference signaling, and as well as cytokine mediated signaling. So this gives clues to the various proteins that are involved in different construct um, action to be able to elucidate the molecular effectors as well as make mechanism of action so uh also in the biological processes we have the um, uh, signal transduction proteins that are actually in a uh, high quantity so also like the protein metabolism as well as cell communication uh, proteins then when we looked at the constructs involving um interleukin 15 with the receptor alpha and the construct without, we saw that um, interferon induced GTP protein as well as squamous cell antigen recognized by T cell was upregulated and these proteins plays role in mediating the spliceosome complex assembly translation, RNA metabolic processes as, well as gene expression. So it gives to, to the fact that perhaps because of the receptor alpha construct in this, there was upregulation of genes which when we looked at those upregulated proteins, they were involved in um, various metabolic processes like tyrosine kinase activity, phosphatic act activities, as well as um, other specific proteins activity. Uh, this is actually a, an heat map of the various uh, profile from the white type, the CAR, the interleukin 15, with the interleukin 15, with the um, receptor alpha construct. So they have distinct profile, which we intend to actually explore deeply in a subsequent study using a, an immunodepletion kit and as well as explore uh, the protein as well as phosphoproteome validate this identified protein as well as uh, using targeted proteomics as well as immune staining approach and then create a map of this interconnected uh, or interrelated proteins that can be used for in-depth analysis and what we intend to be able to uncover at the end of the day since uh we, we are we are uh still in the preliminary phase of this particular research is to be able to identify some of the molecular effectors in this specific construct of this cell therapy developed in the cell based therapy here in brazil and as well as um, understand the mechanistic uh insights and signaling processes and that can perhaps help to overcome some of the challenges um associated with the therapy we would like to thank uh, all of uh, my supervisors and um, collaborators at the Hemo Center, that is the Blood Center, the Faculty of Medicine, Barbreto, and as well as the col collaborator from the German Cancer Research Center, also to our funding bodies and the Black Immunology Group for the kind invitation. Uh, thank you so much. And sorry for the issues with the slide. Don't, but I'm sorry, technology is so weird and, and hard. Um, thank you so much, John, for that really wonderful talk on um, CAR and NK cell therapy. Um, we'll now take some questions.
I'll keep our typing. I can definitely uh, kick us off. So on one of your earlier slides, you had showed that CD44 was increased when talking about your um, CAR T cell therapy. Do you think maybe one of your future directions might be further characterization of like T cell memory, maybe including like, I don't know, CD62L or something, or is that maybe not so much relevant um, to what you're trying to do? Well, what we intend to do in our subsequent studies actually to characterize further the role of this CD44 mm -hmm. and perhaps other uh, inter and interconnected proteins mm -hmm. that are involved uh, in this particular activation to see perhaps we can use it as a switch to be able to turn on and turn off the cell therapy. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, what we intend to or emphasize to study further. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, John. Um, it's really you. wonderful to hear you talk, and I'm super excited to hear more about your T cell work as you progress in your project. So, good luck thank to you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, our next speaker will be Julia Matsu Dapa. Julia is a second year doctoral student in the Pathology, Immunology, and Microbiology program at the Graduate School of Medicine University in the University of Tokyo. She received her MSc. Um, from the University of Tokyo and her BSc from Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. Before moving to the United States for undergrad, she'd spent her childhood in Japan and Ghana, where her passion for immunology grew. Julia is interested in host pathogen interactions during infectious diseases and is currently working on a better understanding of pathogenesis of cerebral malaria. Beyond her work inside the lab, Julia aims to be a bridge between science and the general public engaging in science research. Welcome, Julia. Thank you. I hope you can see my slides okay. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Thank you, Kristen, for the kind introduction. I am Julia, and I'll be talking about locating the plasmodium parasites in the brain during cerebral malaria. But before I start, I would like to talk a little bit about my journey in immunology. So, my I can't talk about my journey in immunology without talking about my background. So I was born in Matsumoto, which is a very small city in the middle of Japan. And when I was nine, I moved to Accra in Ghana. And there I stayed through until high school. And during my time in Ghana, I had classes where I was introduced to these tiny cells, immune cells which had really different shapes and forms, and I thought that they were really cool. So I knocked on the doors of Noguchi Memorial Institute, where I met Professor Ben Jan, pictured here. And there I got my first research experience on neglected tropical diseases, as well as malaria. And his, my time with Professor Jan was fundamental to my passion for immunology. And when I moved to Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas, I majored in biochemistry and molecular biology. But during the summers, I was trying to figure out like what kind of researcher I wanted to be. So there was a time I went back to Noguchi Institute to do some research, but also to Kyoto University as part of the Amden Scholars Program. And there I worked with Dr. Fujita on type 1 interferon inducing viral RNA and using that for tumor treatment. And I re I was reassured that I really do want to do immunology. But what kind of immunology? So pictured here is a blood smear. And the purple colored things are plasmodium parasites in red blood cells. And these parasites are the cause of a disease called malaria, which is quite like threatening. And this is a disease that I got multiple times during my time in Ghana. So I wanted to understand the interactions between these parasites and the immune system or the immune cells that I was really curious about. So I joined the lab of Professor Jabaya Chopin at the Institute of Medical Science in the University of Tokyo in 2019. 
and there I have been working ever since. So malaria is, this is a map of malaria case incidence rate. And as you can see that the majority of the cases or the disease burden is carried by Africa. And in 2020, there were 241 million cases, which caused 627. 627,000 deaths. So this disease, malaria, remains a public health concern. And cerebral malaria is a severe complication of malaria infection. 90% of deaths due to malaria are caused by cerebral malaria, which affects the brain. And one in five children affected by cerebral malaria does not survive. The most susceptible population are children under the age of five and pregnant women. And showing the life cycle of the parasite is that these parasites are carried by mosquitoes. And when mosquitoes inject people, if they like bite people to take blood, they inject their parasites into the bloodstream and these Parasites multiply in the liver as well as in the bloodstream. And during this blood cycle is where we see the symptoms of malaria, such as headaches, fever. And cerebral malaria is seen mostly in children and is characterized by neurological symptoms such as seizures and coma, as well as edema, which is swelling of the brain and sequestration of the infected ripple cells in the in the brain microvessels. We know some things about cerebral malaria, but the exact molecular pathogenesis is still incompletely understood. So we study cerebral malaria in mice using the experimental cerebral malaria model. And this is what we know so far about the experimental cerebral malaria pathogenesis. This is kind of a theory, so it's not set, but when the parasite infects a person, disease in the spleen, phagocytos and cross-present parasite antigens and these prime T cells and circulating infected ripple cells attached to brain endothelial cells and release inflammatory ligands. And in response to these inflammatory ligands, the endothelial cells are activated and they secrete chemokines and cytokines and regulate, upregulate adhesion receptors and molecules. And as leukocytes are recruited and activated, there is a local local pro-inflammatory cycle that causes more parasite accumulation, more endothelial activation, so there's a positive feedback loop. And these activated T cells from the spleen migrate to the brain. And once they recognize the cross-presented parasite antigen on the brain endothelial cells, they would attack and kill off the brain endothelial cells, causing blood brain barrier disruption and eventual edema and leads to death. So what we know is that the immune system does the harm. And previously, before I joined Choban Lab, they found that the olfactory bulb is visibly damaged during experimental cerebral malaria pathogenesis. So the olfactory bulb is a region at the forefront of the brain important for processing information about the sense of smell. And we show that compared to naive, after day six of infection, when the mice are sick with cerebral malaria, we see the brain is damaged. And we also showed with MRI that there are disruptions in the olfactory bulb. That led me to the question, how does the olfactory bulb contribute to the pathology of experimental cerebral malaria? And in order to address this, I performed tissue clearing on infected mouse brains to see exactly where the parasites are. So after infecting mice with fluorescent parasites, 
I went through a series of steps to clear the tissue so this brain becomes transparent like this. And here is the image. In green are the parasites and in purple are the blood vessels. And as you can see, the green parasites are localized in particular regions of the brain, namely the olfactory bulb. And these parasites are just in the olfactory bulb, but not in other parts of the brain. And I quantified the parasites or the GFP signals from the different parts of the brain and found that there are more of these signals in the olfactory bulb, significantly more than in the cortex or in the cerebellum or in the brainstem. And I was also able to confirm this by qPCR of different brain regions where there were higher transcripts of the parasite genes in the olfactory bulb compared to the rest of the brain. And taking a closer look at the olfactory bulb region showed that many of the GFPs or the parasite signals do not overlap with the alpha anti-smooth muscle axin stained blood vessel structure, which suggested that the parasites are found in blood vessels which are tinier than the ones stained by SMA, or they are outside the blood vessels. And I was also interested in whether the olfactory bulb is essential for the pathology of experimental cerebral malaria. And in order to address this, we performed bulbectomy, which is the surgical removal of the olfactory bulb of mice and waited two weeks for them to recover from the surgery and then carried out infection and tissue clearing of the brain. And here is the image that I got. Again, in purple are the blood vessels and in green, the parasites. On the left is naive, on the right is the infected brain. And this time, the parasites are localized elsewhere they are mostly in the brainstem regions. And there is still some parasites where the olfactory bulb used to be. So what we concluded from this is that the parasites localize in the brainstem when there is no olfactory bulb. The bulbectomized mice brain looks like this. So compared to and these are both infected compared to the usual case where you see edema or the swelling of the brain. There is no such, but then there is bleedings in other parts of the brain, namely the brainstem. When we also saw that the barbectomized mice tend to survive a little longer compared to control group after plasmodium infection. And to summarize this, I would say that cerebral malaria is caused by the overaction of the immune system in response to plasmodium infection. And these parasites preferentially localize in the olfactory bulb during experimental cerebral malaria. And in the absence of the olfactory bulb, the parasites localize in the brainstem. So this is still something that I am working on. I only shared just a little, like the introduction of my work but I am still working on how does the olfactory bulb contribute to this pathogenesis of this disease. So what I show today is that there is an accumulation of the infected replace cells in the olfactory bulb. But how does this relate to the immune cell infiltration during malaria or the bleedings in the microvessels and the eventual breakdown of the blood brain barrier? So what cells, what genes, what proteins are involved and at what time point and how are these things related and cause cerebral malaria. And what I'm interested also is how is this translatable to humans? But this is all in the works. 
just the beginning. And I would like to acknowledge my group. This is my PI, Professor Chaban, and my collaborators, Professor Tainaka and Nigata University, who was really crucial for the image and their brains. And I also like to thank Dr. Ishii. And since I have a little more time, I would like to talk about immunology in Japan. What I've noticed, my personal take, is that in Japan, immunology is like very basic research that connected dots. So they tend to be very narrow, special, specialized. And what I've seen is that we work a lot on cytokines and chemokines and signaling pathways. Like identify what kind of molecules are involved at what point. And there's also interest in tolerance and immune suppression as well as infection and immunity. And the other thing is that immunology is more familiar to the general public thanks to works like cell cell work, which introduced not just kids, but lots of people to the players of the immune system and how the body works in response to infection. Yeah, and this is the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Julia. That was really wonderful. And those images were stunning. I would love to get that protocol. I'll email you later about that. <laughs> we have some time for, for questions. <clears throat> So Dr. Palmer says, hi, Julia, really interesting talk. Um, do you see any other changes in the brain after infection, such as altered fibrosis? Thank you for the question. I haven't looked really at fibrosis, but then what I usually look at is like, there is a lot of immune cell infilt infiltration. So there are lots of CD80 cell inflammatory monocytes in the brain after infection. Structurally, I haven't seen fibrosis, but maybe it's just because I haven't looked. Thank you. Um, another question, Julia, the images of the brain are amazing. You might have mentioned this. Is there a reason why the parasite prefers the OB? That's the million dollar question for me, at least. Why the olfactory bulb? That's is the question I am trying to address. And I have hints, but not exactly an answer. It could be the anatomical structure, maybe the structure of the blood vessels, or maybe the endothelial cells in the olfactory bulb might be expressing molecules or adhesion molecules that are preferable for the like, infected replica cells to bind. I don't have any clear answers, just guesses. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, and then our last question from Medina. Do you expect any of the glial or other resident brain cells to contribute to the immunopathology? I think so. That's one thing I am working on. It could be like the brain residential cells, like it could be microglia and endothelial cells play a big part in expressing the antigen to like CD8 T cells, right? So it could be that there could be um, other brain resident cells that could be causing the, or well, that could be contributing to the immunopathology. Definitely, I think. Wonderful, thank you so much, Julia, for your gorgeous images and wonderful presentation. We wish you luck in the future, thank you. Our next speaker for this session, I'm sorry, Ugu. Dr. Ugu is a lecturer of immunology and virology at Redeemers University and a postdoctoral research fellow at the African Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Disease, or ASCID. Um, he specializes in translational immunology, immunosurveillance, vaccine, and immunotherapeutic designs for pathogens and one health approach to tackling disease outbreaks. His research focuses on understanding how the immune system modulates the outcome of viral infection. Welcome to Nedu. I'll pass it on to you. 
Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, for the introduction, I'm going to share my screen, I think. Share screen. Um, entire screen, I think. Yes, please. <laughs> um, wait. I don't know what I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. So you can go to the PowerPoint now. Yeah, okay. Um, entire screen, right? Yep. So if you just do the entire screen and you click on the PowerPoint program and then just share uh, presentation mode, we'll be able to see everything. Uh -oh. While we're waiting, I'll take a moment to acknowledge and thank you our ASL interpreters for working very hard. Thank you very much. We couldn't do this without you. Well, I'm trying, I can't see. Okay, I, I see it now. Okay, shit. Do you see okay. it? <laughs> no, not yet. Um, so if you just share the entire desktop like you previously did, I can walk you through the, the sharing screen. I just did now. Okay, I'm going to go again. Okay. Share screen. So entire, where do I, do I go to the entire screen or window? So you'll share the entire screen and then I should be able to like see like all of us on your screen. Then you can click presentation mode on your PowerPoint. Um, yeah, I'm sharing the entire screen now. Okay, we'll give it a second. All right. So great, so I can see your entire desktop. If you want to click on the PowerPoint logo at the bottom. That one? Yes, perfect. And then just go ahead and click uh, presentation mode, the bottom right-hand corner. Um, perfect, all right, and we'll pass it on to you. Thank you, Chinedu. Um, thank you, sorry, technology is difficult, sorry. Um, thank you for the introduction and thanks everyone. So I'm just going to tell the story of the work we're doing at African Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Diseases. So the title of my talk will be Identifying the Correlation of Protective Immunity to Viral Pathogens. So before I begin, I just want to say um, thank you for the invitation to the organizers of Black Immuno. It's, it's an opportunity to share the work we do in Nigeria. And just a little bit summary of my journey. So I did my undergraduate at the University of Ibadan. I studied, I studied veterinary medicine. And I mentioned a professor, Professor Victor Anosa. He taught, he taught us immunology. And he taught us host pathogen interaction. And that was my first love for immunology. And the rest is me and immunology now. So from Nigeria, I moved on to do a master's in immunology at the University of Oxford. And then I did my PhD in veterinary science. With my research was on understanding how dendritic cell modulate outcome of infection at the University of Cambridge. And I'm, I'm back in Nigeria through a grant with the BBSRC working on um, immune translational immunology in Nigeria. I think that's a summary of my journey, so I can get to the work we do. So the first disease that is important to us is Lassa fever. Lassa fever is an important endemic genetic viral hemorrhagic fever disease in West Africa. It is caused by a genetically diverse old world arena virus called Lassa, Lassa virus. Annually, it is estimated to affect about 100,000 people, and, and the case fatality rate is around 26% in Nigeria. The interesting thing about this disease is up to 80% cases of Lassa fever are asymptomatic, while the remaining 20% um, percent get hospitalized, and it can lead to fatality. There is still no licensed vaccine or therapeutics for management of Lassa fever cases. However, there are two like, vaccines that are currently in phase one clinical trial in West Africa. In all of this, the clear, what you define as protective immunity is yet to be elucidated. So most of the work we're doing in 2018, which is when I, moved, I came back to Nigeria, we got a BBSRC grant to on 
a One Health on our project called One Health as a Lectin Vaccine for Ebola and Lassa Fever to study the genetic diversity of Lassa Fever virus and the correlates of protective immunity. On this project, we enrolled um, about 370 survivors of Lassa Fever in southern, in southern Nigeria. And then we also enrolled about 170 close contacts. I'm going to define this close contact. So these close contacts are people who has never tested positive for Lassa fever. They have not had any clinical symptoms of Lassa fever, but have, they have been in contact with Lassa fever patients. For example, the clinicians who manage Lassa cases and also the family members who take care of their family members when they, when they are sick. So this will be the first in-country mean analysis study of Lassa fever and survivors and their contacts in Southern Nigeria. So first of all, we use um, early spot to measure T cell response. So we computationally designed the GP glycoprotein and the nucleoprotein of the Lassa um, virus. And then we feed this to PBMC from both the survivors and then their contact. And then we measure the T, um, T cell interferon gamma cytokine response by counting the spots. So the key take home from this slide is both for the nucleoprotein and the glycoprotein, both the survivors, the one in red, and the contact, they all made the same magnitude of T cell response. And then secondly, we were able to identify some major regions of the nucleoprotein and the glycoprotein that have the broadest T cell response, which are the MP1 and MP6 region, and then the GP3 region. We also measure um, by an antibody response using ELISA, and we measure the binding antibody response, and the result, again, mimic what we saw with the T cell. So both the survivors, remember the survivors had it, uh, were infected with Lazar fever, were sick and then recovered while the contact, again, never had a um, clinical case of Lassa fever. And interestingly, they also have the same magnitude of IgG response to both the GP protein and the nucleoprotein protein of the Lassa virus. Where the story started becoming interesting is then we then went a, a step further to look at um, this binding antibody response. Can they neutralize these viruses? So we use what is called the pseudotype um, technology, where we designed the different glycoproteins sequence of the glycoprotein into different um, HIV um, backbone, such that you could have the different lineage expressed. And then we looked at the ability of the serum from both the survivors and their counter to, to neutralize these pseudo, pseudo, pseudo viruses. And then what we see is that most of the serum from the survivors are, neutral, are able to neutralize most of the pseudo viruses, while very few were able, um, the serum from the contact neutralize the pseudoviruses. The next interesting result we also saw is that then we looked at um, six months post infection. So for the first time point of collecting samples from both the survivors and the contact, and then six months after, the interesting thing again we saw is that more, why most of the survivors retain their binding antibody response, in this case, the IgG response to the GP protein and the nuclear protein of the Lassa virus, the contact um, lost their binding antibody response. So in summary, the everything I've told you is one, they would think there is pre-existing immunity in Lassa fever to Lassa fever in this endemic region in Nigeria, because some of these contacts who have not, who had no history of Lassa fever, no clinical case, no positive case of Lassa fever, has um, the same magnitude of both antibody and T cell response. Secondly, we do, we see that there is cross and um, reactive antibody response to most of the Lassa lineages. And this is important for vaccine design. If you consider that Lassa is a genetically diverse, virus. However, only those that were recovered from active infection, which are the convalescent patients, were the ones that makes neutralizing antibody response. Why most of the contact who have asymptomatic cases do not um, make um, good uh, neutralizing antibody response. And then also the survivors were the ones that are able to retain their binding antibody response, at least for the six months where we followed um, these cases. And then finally, we had um, the regions of the of the, tis, of the Lots of um, protein that induce the strongest T cell response, which is the MP1 and 6 region and the GP3 region. Um, I love I normally put this slide because this was my Eureka moment. This was the first early spot um I say I did in Nigeria when I came back and to God be the glory worked. So while we are still on this when and then COVID happened, at the early days of the COVID pandemic, I think sometimes in 2020, we were lucky to receive a seed fund from Cambridge, Africa 
to also look at the correlate of protective immunity to SARS-CoV-2. And while we were doing that, we were invited by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to join the GAISA group, which is the Global Immunology and Immune Sequencing for Epidemic Response, to, to provide functional immunological data to support um, pathogen sequences on the continent. So that gave birth to the project, the ARISE project, which is the Africa Rapid Immunosurveillance System for Epidemic Response. The objective of the ARISE project for us is one, to provide functional immunological data to support the pathogen genome, genome sequences that we provide from the center. And secondly, to, prove, to serve as a biobank for most of, for convalescent and vaccinated serum for COVID-19 and for other um, pathogen outbreaks. And then this will also provide um, vital support for vaccine development, vaccine efficacy studies, and clinical trial benchmarks. So this is more like the workflow of the platform, what it looks like. So if you know, with the LASA work, we've been able to build some of these tools. So it's basically utilizing the tools we already have in the center to generate this real-time immunological data. So those in, in dark are the ones we already have functional at the center, while those in red are the work we are still trying to set up. So for example, we use, and again, let me not forget to mention that this work is an enormous and efficient collaboration between many of our collaborators and the, the not uh, between North and South collaboration, mostly Cambridge and um, those in the Cambridge and those in the US. So for example, we have ELISA and Luminex platform to which we use to measure binding antibody response. And this was um, set up for us with collaboration with the Jardin Lab in the US and also the University of Massachusetts in Boston. We use our viral serotype uh, neutralization assay to measure neutralizing antibody response, which was a very efficient collaboration with the LVZ lab at the University of Cambridge. We are also setting up our immune um, B cell cloning and immune immunoglobulin sequencing with collaboration with the guys at South Africa. And the idea is to be able to sequence broadly neutralizing antibody response. We use early spot to measure T cell response. And then we also setting up our flow cytometry to be able to do different immune cell phenotyping. We also setting up being a, trying to do this at also at a single cell level using the Tenex um, platform. So these are some of the data we generated for the SARS-CoV-2 and um, the COVID-19 pandemic. We've been able to curate over 600 um, sera samples, which covers different almost all the vaccines that were admitted in Nigeria and both complex and sera as well. Some of the data we've generated so far is, um, for example, we, met, we looked at the binding antibody response to the XRBD um, of, of SARS-CoV-2 from some of the convalescent patients and different waves of SARS-CoV-2. And the key thing we realized is that the patients that were infected during the third wave, which is around July to December 2021, they had a stronger binding antibody response compared to those that were in the first or second wave. This is interesting because this third wave was dominated by, this is when we had the Delta variant of SARS-CoV-2. We've also looked at the different um, um, serum from vaccinated individuals, and the take home from this is that those that had the mRNA-based vaccine had a stronger binding antibody response compared to the, those that had the vector-based vaccine like AstraZeneca, or Johnson and Johnson. We've done some virus neutralization assay, and then the first thing is that there is cross protect and um, neutralization of um, some of the different variants of SARS-CoV. So look at some of the DC14, the beta variant, the delta variant, and then the VA2. And again, our neutralization data mimic what we see with the binding antibody response because we have um, a stronger um, neutralizing antibody um, response to the delta variant from our convalescence here. And when we look at the vaccine sera, those that also um, took the Moderna sera from those that took the mRNA-based vaccine also had a stronger neutralizing antibody response compared to those that took the vector-based vaccine like AstraZeneca. We've done some early spot as well, looking at the T cell response where we designed the, three, um, the different pep um, SARS-CoV-2 proteins. And the take home here is that um, the X1 peptide, which supports the RBD, had a stronger T cell response compared to the other, uh, the nucleopeptide or the, the other part of the X protein. So the summary of the SARS-CoV-2 work we've done is that we do know now that both the convalescent and the vaccinated participants do make both binding and neutralizing antibody response. And then there's cross neutralization of some of the variants of SARS-CoV-2. 
And the Delta variant is the most neutralized variant of SARS-CoV-2, while the Omicron BA2 is the least in our cohort. Then the mRNA vaccine had a stronger neutralizing antibody response compared to the vector-based vaccine AstraZeneca. And the S1 region induced the strongest T cell response compared to the other regions. Why are we doing this work? The idea of this one, which is the impact and the power of these tools, is the ability to generate this immunological data and then we share them to both the National and Regional Center for, um, for Disease Control to, improve, to influence the public health policy and interventions. We also open when we start doing this immunoglobulin sequencing to also provide these broadly neutralizing antibody sequences openly to the scientific community to help to make um, better vaccines and monoclonals and also diagnostics. So some of the future plans with what we do is to set up our flow cytometry, which you already have in the pipeline, the immunoglobulin sequencing as well, and then continue the immunosurveillance um, work for the next um, epidemic and um, for the next pathogen that will cause um, pandemic. This work doesn't come easy because it's easy to present, but we do have some challenges which I've listed here. We do have funding. We do get, we are grateful to Villa Melinda Gates Foundation and the Cambridge Africa for believing in us. Um, rooted collaboration, we've been, we've been grateful, uh, we've been successful in having a very efficient collaboration with some of the people we work with. And then limited availability of lab supplies, as you can see me carrying that four bags. The only bag that is mine in that four bag is a small one on top of the trolley. Also, difficulty in retention of homegrown talent. And on this note, I will go say a very big um, extend our appreciation to all our collaborators and funders who has made this work possible in Nigeria. First of all, to the Lab of Virus Genetics at the University of Cambridge, and um, Cambridge Africa and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for believing in us and supporting what we do, and the rest of everybody who have also been supporting us. This is the team at SGIT and everybody involved in doing this work. And I think my last slide is, I always like, I like this word, if I have seen further, is by standing on the shoulders of giants. So on this, and I always extend my thank you and gratitude to my, first of all, to my PhD supervisor, who is Professor Jonathan Hini at the University of Cambridge, who is always there whenever I call him and just believe that I just need to succeed. And then secondly, to my director at SGIT, Professor Christian Happy, who is always provide all the support and the enabling environment for me to do some of this work I'm doing. And finally, I will leave you with this quote from my friend. Don't worry, every little thing will be all right. I can say thank you. I'm happy to take your question. Thank you so much, Dr. Chinedu. That was a really wonderful presentation. I absolutely love the picture of you in the airport with all the bags. I also travel very like heavy, so it's nice to see not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> and we have time for some questions. Uh, Dr. Palmer says, hi, Dr. Wu, thank you. Amazing work. Could you speculate on the reason why individuals not infected with LV contain reactive T and B cells? Could they have been previously infected with a closely related virus? Um, that's, <laughs> um, that's a very good question. This is it's interesting because one, we think they may have been exposed, they may have been infected, but they may have had asymptomatic infection. And the reason we think that way is because that's the only reason they could have had the Lassa virus. The only reason we think that way is Lassa is endemic here. And like I said in my introduction slide, about 80% are asymptomatic and they don't show symptoms. So the people you call survivors are those that present to the clinic. But many of these things, they have had bouts of Lassa fever and they talk is malaria, they would have treated malaria and they feel okay. So indeed, that, you, you will see it in their immune response, but unfortunately, they didn't present for you to see when they had the active cases. So I would think, yeah, they, they have been infected, but mostly, most likely they have asymptomatic infection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a question from Adam Savage. Very interesting talk, Dr. Wu. Similar question to Dr. Palmer. Any idea whether the Lassa fever IG seen in the asymptomatic context is due to something like subclinical infection or low exposure dose, or rather something intrinsic to the host's immune function? Um, the last part, something intrinsic to the host's immune function. I wish we know that. If we know that, then I think, would have been, I think we should have won a Nobel Prize. Um, honestly, on the other part, I think we do think is low or subclinical infection. But what we're now trying to do is, can we unravel what is going on with the asymptomatic cases? 
who are the people that will get hospitalized and those that will get asymptomatic? What is the future driving it? So these are things we are hoping to unravel, you know. We don't know why some will have a symptomatic infection, why some will be hospitalized. So these are some of the works we are hoping to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you for those interesting questions. Um, any more questions from attendees before we wrap up? Okay, thank you to all the speakers for sharing your fabulous work and to the attendees for your very engaging questions. Um, we hope you'll stick around. Sorry. We hope you'll stick around for the Branding Yourself as a Scientist workshop next at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Um,